on BBC Radio 5 Sports Extra. We are back in the land of the cherry blossoms. Round four of the Formula One World Championship arrives at the iconic Suzuka circuit in Japan. Much earlier than we're used to and only just over half a year or so since we were last racing here. Uh, cloudy skies, overcast skies above this figure of eight circuit with fans filling up the grandstands ahead of free practice one. Uh, guiding you through all the coverage across the weekend is myself, Harry Benjamin. Alongside me is the race driver Alice Powell and the BBC F1 uh, chief writer Andrew Benson. Uh, let's bring you up to speed first of all with how the championship lies before we get stuck into things ahead uh, in the drivers championship despite retiring his first race in a year uh, from the Australian Grand Prix. Max Verstappen still leads the championship by four points 51 points to his name. Charles Leclerc in second then Perez, Sainz and Piastri the top five. Over in the constructors championship it's Red Bull who lead the way by four points, 97 to their name ahead of Ferrari. Then it's McLaren, Mercedes and Aston Martin, the top five, with RB and Haas rounding out the top seven and the point scorers. Williams, Sauber and Alpine still yet to get off the mark. And that is how the 10 teams line up as we begin to get stuck in to this uh, uh, rather brilliant track, Alice. It's a, it's a driver's favourite. It's a fan's favourite. Everyone loves Suzuka, don't they? They do. I mean, I've only done it virtually. I've never been there in real life, if you'd like to say it that way. But uh, no, certainly a massive favourite with many of the drivers and especially Japan. And again, I haven't really been to Japan either. And what a wonderful place Japan is. It's incredible. The fans, I think the fans really, really make it as well as the circuit. They are just so passionate. And you see all these crazy hats that they they make as we're, we're getting a, a sight of some of them now. Some RB hats there. They've got their big, uh, big signs and even people going full out dressing up Harry I think uh, maybe that's a step you should take tomorrow well I've definitely spotted uh, a few DRS hats they uh, part and parcel uh, that the Japanese fans bring uh, to uh, this Suzuka track they absolutely love it uh, I remember seeing last year as well you know, a, a full on Fernando Alonso Ferrari replica suit and helmet that someone had dressed up in it they absolutely uh, go crazy for it uh, and everyone loves the track as you say 18 turns 10 to the right 8 to the left 5.8 kilometers, 3.6 miles, just over that, and uh, a figure of eight layout going back on yourself. And it is, thanks to uh, being in April now, this race, it really is uh, cherry blossom season in full flow with uh, Mary Cherry Blossom Trees uh, surrounding the circuit. Come and on, give us your cherry blossom. I wasn't going to go, I wasn't going to go so soon. No, uh, there are two, according to Ferrari, there are 226 varieties of cherry tree found in Japan. Those well-known cherry blossom experts from Maranello. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it came from them. I trust them. I trust them. Um, look, it's also a special weekend, we should say. It's a home race, of course, uh, for the only Japanese driver on the grid in the form of Yuki Tsunoda for RB. Had a really good uh, race uh, last time out, did uh, Tsunoda uh, in uh, Australia. Finished seventh uh, in uh, the uh, race after being promoted due to the penalty the post-race penalty for Fernando Alonso. And he's actually uh, got a Japanese teammate in the other car for free practice one this weekend. Ayumu Iwasa, the 22-year-old from Osaka, makes his FP1 debut for the RB team. Uh, he's part of the uh, the Honda Formula Dream project and a Red Bull junior as well. He's been racing in Formula 2 the last couple of seasons. And this year uh, is racing uh, in the Japanese Super Formula Championship. Actually raced in Suzuka not too long ago. Finished ninth in that race. Uh, so gets his first shot uh, in the RB. Uh, so how crucial is this going to be, Alice, for, for someone like Iwasa getting that first shot at a track? It's a tough track to, to debut at. We've seen many do it before. Max Verstappen, of course, about this 10 years ago made his debut here. Uh, but tough track to make your debut at, uh, but one he'll know and have a little bit of experience on already. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly going to know this track. But what a debut to, to have coming into to this practice session, your home track. And what the, there is going to be pressure on his shoulders, of course, if you're sitting in anything to do with a Red Bull, uh, which RB, of course, in theory is. He will have the pressure on his shoulders, but he had good Whoa. success. He had some stunning drives in Formula 2 over the years. As we continue to see uh, a little stuff.
toy dog has made its way to the grandstand but I, he i think he'll he'll shine in this one i really do think that he will he will shine but yuki sonoda is flying this year isn't he i think he's ha certainly having his best start to uh to a formula one season for sure he's definitely showing uh showing Daniel Ricciardo the way around, is it, which is not what we all thought would be happening as uh, the light goes green and the guy we were just talking about, Yumi Uwasa, of course, he's first out on track. Yep, green light on at the end of the pit lane and FP1 is underway. First track action for Suzuka is go with 59 minutes and 25, 24, 23 seconds remaining on the clock. Now, of course, what this does do with Iwasa being in that second RB alongside Tsunoda, that puts Daniel Ricciardo on the sidelines for this session. He's actually sat on the pit wall alongside team principal Lauren Mekis uh, watching on and it, it's just not going the way for Daniel Ricciardo. At a time where it is, it, the driver market is on the verge of implode, imploding, really, if it hasn't done so already. Ricardo, everyone thinking you'd be a shoe in for, for that second seat at Red Bull with a, with a perhaps an underperforming Perez. But right now, as you alluded to earlier, it's Sonoda who has the upper hand here. Yeah, I think everyone, when Daniel Ricciardo came back obviously he then broke his 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 hand at Zanvoort they were all hyped and thought he's had a year off and sometimes that does people good you know taking time away from from the sport because he was under a lot of pressure at McLaren and he just he just I'm not gonna say crumbled under the pressure because that's not necessarily what happened but he he needed a break didn't he I think we we were looking at a Danny Ricardo that almost was a little bit broken so having time away from from the sport can certainly help. So we were all expecting Daniel Ricciardo to come back and be like, wow, this is it. He's starting afresh. He is with a team that he's had great history with before. He's had the pre-season build up, which he didn't get last year. And we thought, yeah, OK, here we go. But it's just not seemed to have happened for him, has it? Yeah, dangerous, that McLaren coming out of the garage. Yeah, copy that. That's Esteban Ocon on the radio in his Alpine as he was coming down, doing quite a dramatic swerve uh, as uh, the McLaren peeled out of the pit box. Uh, so I'm sure the stewards will have a look at that one. And Ocon straight away on the radio uh, reporting that. So with Daniel Ricciardo, I think the question was what had happened at McLaren? Was it specific to his relationship with McLaren? that had ensured that he hadn't been able to compete with Lando Norris? Was there something about the McLaren car in particular that for some reason he hadn't been able to adapt to? Or was there some wider issue with him as a driver? And, you know, what happened last summer was he got dropped by McLaren a year before the end of, the end of his contract at the end of 2022. And they brought in Oscar Piastri. And Ricardo went back to Red Bull as reserve driver. And they gave him a run in the Red Bull car at Silverstone in the summer and according to Christian Horner he was on the pace straight away and if anyone's watched the latest Netflix Drive to Survive series you can watch there's an episode about it and he just seemed to set some quick lap times problem is you never know when you're at a test on your own it's a different day as yeah, well what does conditions. the lap time actually mean and you think Red will be able to cross correlate on that but anyway they made the decision that he was competitive in that test and they brought him back he had two races, and he beat Sonoda in one of them, but he didn't beat Sonoda in the other. Then he broke his hand, a little bit of a traffic jam at the chicane, um, uh, as the practice gets going. Um, and then Liam Lawson came in to replace him while his hand recovered, and Lawson did pretty impressively for a rookie. He didn't beat Sonoda either, but he was, he was up there. Ricardo came back at the end of last season and wasn't convincingly ahead of Sonoda. And so the question heading into this season was, could he recover what was people would regard as the Ricardo of old? This is a guy who, at least for a while, beat Max Verstappen when they were teammates at Red Bull. OK, Verstappen eventually uh, got the upper hand by the time Red Bull decided to leave. And sorry, but Ricardo decided to leave. And that's why Ricardo decided to leave, really, because he thought the team had become focused on Verstappen. But it's becoming, it's beginning to look as if the old Ricardo isn't coming back because he's been beaten by Sonoda basically all year. He was very, very slow compared to Sonoda in Melbourne last time out, half a second or something in qualifying. And 
the problem for him in that basis is you can't get beaten by your teammate in full one full stop but even more than that helmut marco who at least until the whole Red Bull power struggle that evolved out of the christian horner scandal um who makes the driver decisions at rb doesn't rate Sonoda. So if you're not beating the guy who makes the decision, who if you're not beating the guy who the guy who makes the decisions doesn't rate, you've got a bit of a problem on your hands. Uh, just, just question Andrew on that. Sorry, if if Helmut Marco doesn't rate Sonoda, then why is Sonoda still in the car? Well, because the engine is made by the people who back him. So once the engine goes. When it, become, when it becomes effectively the, the Red Bull powertrains in association with, with, with supply from Ford as well. Uh, Sonoda needs to find a, a new driver before then, or do you think what he's doing right now might convince a, a helmet marker that actually maybe Sonoda could be worth a shot in that second seat alongside Verstappen? I, I don't know, and a number of things could happen uh, in the intervening period. So for example, there's the Red Bull power struggle to take into account in that question too. So there's a lot of imponderables that you're asking me there. Um, on the face of it, though, he's there because of Honda, and he wouldn't be there without Honda. Um, now, there are people at RB. I was speaking to someone there, someone pretty senior at RB, uh, last week, and they were telling me that actually Sonoda's performing at a really high level at the moment, and he's underestimated. Um, that he'd been really impressed by his performance this year so far, um, and that it was it was unfair of people to re to re be regarding him, his Russell. This McLaren just stopped the middle of the corner here. Yeah, Russell on the radio coming into the final chicane and uh, Iwasa had to set a very similar moment to the lap before. Uh, everyone backing up slowly, trying to get a little bit of a gap. Uh, this is the sound of Carlos Sainz coming through turns one and two and is uh, greeted and uh, had to get out of the way and is blocked right on the exit. Uh, raises his hand in frustration. So early days in these uh, free practice, in this free practice one session, but traffic proving to be uh, a little bit tricky there. Yeah, that was the jam I was referring to when I was expounding about Ricardo earlier. Um, yeah, so um, what was I talking about? Ah, oh, yes, Sonoda. Um, so he's, they say he's actually performing at a really high level, but again, of course, you can't actually tell because it's all about relatives, isn't it? And if Ricardo's not performing and you're the guy who's leading the team and you're doing a really good job, it can look like you're doing a really good job until someone else gets in and goes faster. Now, I'm not saying someone would, but, you know, it's the, it's the imponderable for all the teams. You know, people said Alex Albon was doing a great job in the Williams last year. Well, this is the same Alex Albon who was beaten by Max Verstappen by a half a second a lap on average at Red Bull. So was it that he was underperforming at Red Bull because he didn't like the car and the way it behaved because it's all focused on Verstappen and he likes a very pointy front end? Or was it just that's what his level was and it's just his teammate was even lower than that? I, it's, it's, that's Formula One. It's, it's all these questions you don't know. Here's the thing. If... Daniel Ricciardo carries on with the, the pace that he's currently got, that gap to, to Yuki Sonoda. They gave Nick De Vries 10 races because it's Daniel Ricciardo and he's a name and you know, he's experienced, unlike De Vries. Personally, I don't think they gave De Vries long enough, but, but there we go. I guess that's an old story. Are they going to kick out Ricciardo? Well, the word in Australia, and I don't know whether this is true, but this was just a rumour going around the paddock, was that uh, he's got till Miami, and if he doesn't improve, he's out, and Lawson will be coming in. Wow. That's not too far away, is it? It's not. A race is time, a few races time. It is, uh, and even if it, it is just purely a rumour, you know, people talk about it in the paddock, don't they, and that comes with, with pressure. So, well, let's see, Ricardo said, uh, I think after Australia, he, he's struggling in, in the high-speed corners in particular, doesn't bode well for, for Suzuka, which is a mixture of high-speed and low-speed as well, and of course, he's down a session because Ayumu Iwasa is getting a go in FP1 in his car. So, well, let's see how uh, the RB situation continues to to unfold. They have brought uh, some new upgrades to their car in the form of uh, some bits on the floor. In fact, a lot of teams uh, have bought upgrades uh, this weekend. Red Bull uh, with upgrades to the side pod and the floor. Ferrari, a new rear suspension. Uh, McLaren uh, to the front corner. Aston Martin with quite a big upgrade as well uh, involving the floor and the diffuser. Uh, Alpine, front wing, corner and beam wing. Uh, Williams, it's all wings for them. Uh, and Sauber as well, bringing some bits uh, to the floor uh, with 50 minutes and 24, 23, 22 seconds remaining of free practice one. It's Lando Norris in the McLaren who's currently fastest, a 131.781 set on the medium compound of tyre. 
Sergio Perez is behind him on the hard compound attire, though less than half a tenth slower. Then it's Alonso, Hamilton, Sonoda, the top five. Sainz, Piastri, Russell, Joe, Ocon, the top ten. Leclerc, Gasly, Magnussen, Hulkenberg, Sargent, the top 15. And they are all the drivers that have set lap times so far. Charles Leclerc in the Ferrari is just coming around the final corner now and across the line to go fourth fastest. A 132.3 on the hard compound of tyre. Pirelli bringing the hardest tyres in the range uh, for uh, this Suzuka uh, track as well. Um, so uh, that is how it's unfolding at the moment. So, so there's an interesting thing about, just wanted to mention about Ferrari. So it's obviously quite a, a striking statistic that the only, peop the only person to beat a Red Bull driver in a race since the Brazilian Grand Prix in 2022 is Carlos Sainz, who did it in Singapore last year and in Melbourne two weeks ago. But what's interesting, and I'm just mentioning this because I'm looking at the lap times and Charles Leclerc is fourth and Carlos Sainz is seventh. Actually, the most impressive Ferrari driver in performance is on balance Charles Leclerc. And he was talking about this yesterday. You know, he was saying, he was saying actually my performance generally has been really good it's just that on the one okay on, on the the two occasions that we've been in a position to beat red bull carlos has been ahead of me and i need to sort that out myself obviously that's my fault but it is a slight it is a slightly unfair picture i think about the ferrari driver comparison that that that, 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 that statistic happens to be and it makes carlos Sainz look fantastic and he has been fantastic in both those races don't get me wrong and he's a really very good driver it's just that it's, it just reflects a little bit unfairly on Charles Leclerc, I think, in terms of the, the overall picture. I think that is fair to say because on balance and the stats show that, that Leclerc is the faster driver as uh, the signs overtakes uh, Leclerc in uh, coming down to uh, the the straight that approaches the left-hander, the fast left-hander, 130R. Uh, but of course, signs the most recent Formula One race winner this season that isn't Max Verstappen are making his way through the chicane now. But, Alice, at the end of the day, Sainz has been the one to, to get those headline results, and especially in, you know, the run-up to, to Melbourne with the, uh, the, the appendix getting uh, taken out of him, the whole storyline. If he'd been racing in Saudi Arabia, he, there's a good possibility, we don't know where he would have finished in Saudi, but he, it's a good possibility he could be leading this Drivers' Championship right now, which I think we're all expecting Max Verstappen to come back and absolutely you know, wipe the field again this weekend. But Sainz is out of a job for next year. That puts him at the top of everybody's list, if, it were, if he wasn't already, no? I mean, yes, certainly at the top of most people's lists. The fact that he is out of a job, he's not going to be without a job, realistically, is he? Let's face it, he'll, we, he will be on the grid somewhere uh, next year as Max Verstappen now. Here we go. We'll find out very shortly that possibly the pace of this Red Bull as Max starts a flying lap. A little bit of track traffic. He is on the, the hard tyre. But, you know, to, to come back to, to Carlos Sainz, super impressive and he he was quite gingerly he got out the car quite gingerly didn't he at the end of uh, the australian grand prix so still suffering but i did see last night he was doing quite a few laps around the uh, the track on his his push bike so clearly trying to top up his fitness uh, after that surgery yeah he says he can't he still can't pull the big weights in the gym because of his appendix operation uh, in Saudi Arabia so this thing about the driver market Harry I would be careful if I were you about saying Carlos Sainz is at the top of everybody list of everybody's lists because think about what's happening in the driver market okay so Ferrari are tied up with Hamilton and Leclerc next year McLaren are tied up with Norris and Piastri Everything else is up for grabs. We don't even know, even though Max Verstappen, who's just coming through the chicane at the start of his final, his first lap, by the way, he's on the hard tyre, he's not going to go fastest, um, uh, is that even Max Verstappen, who, although he's contracted to Red Bull until 2028, because of the fallout from the Christian Horner scandal, he might not even stay at Red Bull next year. So Mercedes, for example, have got a seat open because Hamilton's left. Um, Aston Martin have potentially got a seat open because Fernando Alonso's contract comes to an end. So, you've got the question of... And also, Red Bull have got a seat open because Sergio Perez's contract runs out. Now, so, Verstappen could leave because he's not happy with the Horner situation at all. Neither are, neither are some other senior people at Red Bull, I'm told. 
if he leaves, there's suddenly two seats at Red Bull Open. Where does he go? Potentially Mercedes. Mercedes' list at the moment in terms of order priority is Verstappen, one. Andrea Kimi Antonelli, two. Who's the Formula 2 driver there, 17-year-old protégé. Fernando Alonso, three. Then, only then, does Carlos Sainz come into the picture at Mercedes, for example. Sainz is definitely a contender at Red Bull for the potentially for the Perez seat if Verstappen stays, but so is Fernando Alonso. And if you're Red Bull, would you pick Alonso or Sainz? Interesting question. So it's, I would be very careful about saying Sainz is the top of everybody's list because I don't think he is. Oh, I would. I, I get obviously. Uh, of course, you'll get a seat. I guess yeah. he's the top of everyone's list if Max isn't available and if Alonso stays where he is. Well, that, that's the thing. That he's a high, <laughs> yeah. Max does have a contract. Can you take not those the top people? Of the list, is he? <laughs> It's an interesting conversation. I think, I mean, look, he's, he's going to be in the top half of most people's list. So he deserves a seat, basically. <laughs> he definitely de deserves a seat. He uh, look, he's going to get a seat. The thing is, there's lots of seats. There's at least one Red Bull seat. There's at least one Mercedes seat. There's at least one Aston Martin seat. Also, Sauber, which are about to become Audi mm. in 2026. That's a potentially appealing thing, although not immediately. And that's mm. the other thing science has got to factor in. He's nearly 30. Um, but he will be past 30 by the time Audi become Audi in 2026. And are they going to be competitive in 2026? No. Might take them four or five years. So, difficult one. Um, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting driving market. And of course, he'll end up in Formula 1 because he's a fantastic driver. It's just unfortunate for him to lots of other fantastic drivers around as well. How many more years do you reckon Alonso's got in him? Well, I know hundred. all this stuff about, <laughs> oh, I haven't decided what I'm going to do with my future yet. I have to decide first whether I want to stay in Formula 1. That's all nonsense. <laughs> OK, he definitely has decided. Aston Martin have got a t offered him a contract on the table already. He hasn't signed it. Um, he's presumably got his eye on a Red Bull seat um, as priority number one. Why wouldn't he? I mean, I find it really interesting that I remember having a conversation with Christian Horner in the Russian Grand Prix paddock in 2014 when I was saying, what on earth are you doing signing Danny Kvyat when you've got Fernando Alonso on the market? And he was like, oh no, Kvyat's the best option for us. And I'm like, come off it. So, and they wouldn't even get, and there were a number of times before that where Red Bull had had talks with Alonso. 2013 was another example when he wanted to leave Ferrari. And they didn't give him a seat when he was in his early 30s. Why are they giving him a seat potentially in his early 40s? I don't know. But, um, that's Apparently not... life doesn't start until you're 40. Exactly. That's well, what people keep telling me. Patience pays off. Perhaps, maybe. Alonso has just gone second fastest, actually. Identical lap time to Lando Norris. Um, a 131.781, both uh, on the medium compound of tyres. Norris, Alonso, Perez, Russell, Leclerc, the top five. Sainz, Hamilton, Sonoda, Verstappen uh, on the hard tyre. Down in ninth, ahead of Joe, the top ten. Piastri, Ocon. Sergeant Hulkenberg, Bottas, the top 15. Magnussen, Gasly, the 17 drivers who have all set time. Still waiting lap times from Stroll. Iwasa, who now heads across uh, the start line and through turns one and two on embarking on his uh, first proper flying lap on the medium compound attire. And also Alex Albon, no lap time. Uh, he's still in the pits. Uh, but let's see how Iwasa gets on then on this uh, first lap. The uh, current Super Formula driver, Three wins in Formula 2 last year on his way to fourth in the championship. Couldn't quite break into that top three, but as we said, he's supported by Honda and Red Bull as well. Makes his way into the first of the Degnas, then the second Degna, gravel to your left, makes his way out. Slight right-hand king before you then head into the braking zone for the hairpin. Turn 11, the left hand up, one of the slowest corners on the track. And now you make your way slightly uphill cambered corner through the right hand arch of turn 12 approaching spoon curve the left hander through turns 13 and 14 looking neat and tidy for Awasa I suppose that's the, the name of the game for Awasa in an FP1 session isn't it Alice just to keep it neat and tidy and uh, don't crash the car <laughs> Basically, you hit the nail on the head there, Harry. He will want to get plenty of mileage, of course, under his belt. These opportunities don't come come around very often at all, and he'll, of course, have a run planned that RB will want to, to cycle through as well. But racking up those laps, he's not going to set the world on fire, as you, you mentioned, but keeping it on track, and it did look fairly steady. He's going to cross the line now, only jump up a couple of positions, three seconds off. Lando Norris's time, which is also set on the medium tyre, pops up into 18th place. 
2010 Korean Grand Prix was the last time two Japanese drivers appeared on the track in the form of Kamui Kobayashi and Sakon Yamamoto in the Hispania racing car. Gosh. They had they had a, a, a different driver in, in their car every race, it seemed, back then um, in 2010. But uh, And, of course, Kobayashi, the most recent uh, Japanese podium finisher in that rather emotional podium uh, back in 2012 uh, for uh, Kobayashi and uh, the Japanese fans up on their feet celebrating uh, that one. Uh, lots of uh, work going on in the garages at the moment. Work being done on Fernando Alonso's car. So uh, is the two Williams cars. Sargent uh, has set a lap time enough for 15th fastest. Albon, no lap time set from him just yet. Uh, both are in the pits and Alice, they're off the back of a, of a really intense weekend for them, aren't they? After having to stand down Logan Sargent to, to take uh, effectively his chassis and, and put it onto Alex Albon's car so that he could race after he crashed in, in practice and, and give Albon the best possible chance of scoring points. And what's unfolded this weekend is that, well, they've, they've sent that chassis, the broken one, back to uh, Grove, repaired it, it's ready, but it's being refitted back to Sargent's car, not going back to its original owner, Alex Albon. That, to me, seems a little bit unfair. I know Formula One isn't a fair business, but what would you make of that? I mean, yeah, fr from your point of view, it's unfair. And fr probably wait from us sitting here as, as fans and go, well, that's not fair. He didn't crash the car. But from a Williams point of view, who's likely to get them points? And points, of course, make prizes. The Constructors' Championship is a, a big, big deal for, for the teams, usually more than the Drivers' Championship. And that is Alex Albon, who is yet to, to set a lap time, still in the pits. So I, I totally understand from a Williams point of view why they have decided to, to sort of give Sargent the repaired car because, you know, it has been repaired, but it's unlikely to 100% be the same as before. That's from experience when... Uh, 100 grams I'm, heavier, we've heard. Well, you know, it can all make the difference. <laughs> it can all make the difference. Um, but no, it, it won't be. Let's face it, it's not going to be the same as, as when... Uh, before, prior to it being crashed as normal service has resumed for Max Verstappen on the hard tyre jumps up to top of the times a 131.463 as uh, he's on a cool down lap and numbers are continued to be scribbled down in the, the Red Bull garage work continuing hard in the grandstands as well as lots of young keen fans uh, looking left looking right taking in the sights and also catching the sights themselves on the tv but one guy that's probably not enjoying taking in the sights is daniel ricardo who sat there on the the pit wall taking in information and, and watching this session of course yeah i mean you'll know this alice as well formula one is is a physical game but it's also a mental game too and, and ricardo they're having to sit out for Uwasa, but also just coming back to, to the sergeant storyline as well already having to take the hit in australia then this this weekend you know having to, to take it is fixed but it's still the it will be known as the damn chassis and his place within that williams lineup now okay there was arguments about whether they should have retained him in the first place for this season they did they supported him they backed him james vows put an arm around him and said you know we're with you all the way but surely after the events of the last couple of weekends if, if you're sergeant that's so difficult to keep your, your mental game strong in that instant it is but it depends how you look at it he could there's two options he could sit there and go well you know this is all a bit depressing i've had to miss a grand prix for no fault of my own you know, it's not fair. The team obviously think very little of me. You know, it's not great. Or he could take it, which if I was giving him advice, not that he needs my advice, then he would, I would say to him, use this as fuel to your fire to say, right, I'm going to go out there and prove them wrong. I'm going to give Williams a reason to, to look back on that decision and go, oh, I think we made the wrong decision here. You Could know. light a fire. Exactly. And I think that's how he, sh he should be looking at it. I don't know how he's looking at it. Hopefully, for his sake, he'll be looking at it at that point of view to really be like, I'm going to prove them wrong. Clearly, I'm, of course, I know I'm not the number one driver, and Alex Albon is. 
but I'm gonna I'm gonna give them reasons to 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 feel bad at the choices that they made at, at the Australian Grand Prix and. At the moment, we've got nothing to compare against right now during this session because Alex Albon's still in the pits. But that's the only way that Sargent can can try and and swing it to his advantage in in, in the mental side of, of things. Anyway, I don't mean to be brutal about this, right? But Pullman One is a hard business, and he wouldn't be in this position if he'd been quicker. That's what it boils down to. Uh, you, 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 it's all about lap time. And he got beaten by Alex Albon every single qualifying session last year. You know, what does what's he expect? Okay, Al, it, of course it looks bad to, from the outside. Albon crashed the car, and then Sargent's the guy who misses the race and gets the repaired chassis. I mean, the, the, the chassis should be exactly the same, apart from 100 grams of weight. It should be, but, the tech, but whether it actually is a different question. But you know. You, and this is the point about Form 1, you've got to come in and you've got to deliver straight away. And when, they're really, when drivers are really good, that's what they do. You know, would this have happened to Fernando Alonso or Lewis Hamilton in, at the start of their second season in Form 1? No way. But he hasn't performed at that level. And until he does, he can't expect anything else. Yeah, and, uh, and that, the stats show it, the lap time shows it. Uh, ultimately... They gave the car to uh, to Albon to, to try and score points because that that midfield battle is so tight. And he made a really good fist of it. I mean, okay, there were a couple of retirements. Uh, Russell crashed at the end and all the rest of it. And Hamilton's engine blew up, but he finished 11th. And he was battling with the Haas drivers. Haas is a faster car at the moment this year, so far. And he very nearly scored a point. And would Sargent have got that close to the points? No. I think that's what it boils down to. And actually, although you could say, okay, but he didn't actually score a point. I think when you're, you know, considering if we Verstappen doesn't retire all that often and Hamilton also retiring too, but even if he hadn't have scored uh, points, 11th place finish in that midfield battle could actually be quite crucial as well on things like count back because when you're only scoring one, maybe two points in that midfield battle, an 11th place could elevate your team above the other in that fight at the back because, you know, it's it's Williams, Sauber and Alpine, the, the final three teams and the constructors and Williams are at the head of that pack at least thanks to their two 11th place finishes. So that is something to bear in mind uh, as well for them. Um, not many cars out on track at the moment. Uh, I count four. The sound you're hearing is Lance Stroll in the Aston Martin. Never made Q3 and hasn't scored a point here since 2019. Uh, hoping to try and right those wrongs this time around. Makes his way through the fastest corner on the circuit. The left hander of 130 yard before you suddenly break in uh, to the final chicane. Turns 16, 17 and 18. Known as the Casio Triangle. The pit lane entry to your right as you make your way round the slightly right hand corner which brings you on to the main straight crosses the line uh, for stroll on that medium compound of tire in 11th uh, that last lap around uh, 132 492 for stroll iwasa back out there as well putting in the mileage uh, but it's Verstappen on top of 131.4 ahead of Norris who's just come out uh, on an outlap as well and actually some developing news uh, from McLaren over the last couple of days uh, Andrew I, I want to bring you on this as well a, a, a technical change once again for, for the team yeah it's quite interesting actually so um, a little while ago McLaren announced a new technical structure with um, sort of three uh, technical directors underneath the team principal Andrea Stella it looks a bit weird on the face of it um, because it feels a bit like you've got your sort of technical leadership split into three different areas, but that is the whole point. It was they've taken the principle behind it is they've taken the sort of three areas of Formula One engineering, aerodynamics, performance, and uh, the sort of design and build basically, and put them under three leaders with Stella in charge, and he's a kind of technical team principal basically. Now, one of the guys that they recruited to do that is someone called David Sanchez, uh, who um, was at Ferrari previously, and he'd worked with Stella at Ferrari back in the day before Stella joined McLaren, along with Fernando Alonso at the end of 2014. He's left Sanchez after just three months in his role. Um, now, what McLaren is saying about that is that when they recruited David Sanchez, um, the role was a much wider broader scope than it turned out to be when he got to McLaren and he has obviously found that unsatisfying and he and Stella have um, decided between themselves that um, uh, 
that therefore it's it's fair to let him go. And I'm told that they haven't they were friends. I'm told they haven't fallen out. And they've let him go without any gardening leave period, which is interesting, which does suggest it's relatively harmonious. Um, or you could say it suggests that it's relatively harmonious. Another thing that's changed is that Rob Marshall, who uh, was one of those three people that they recruited um, as one of those three technical directors, they've changed his job title to chief designer. He used to be at Red Bull. He was like Adrian Newey's chief lieutenant at Red Bull for a, through the Vettel dominant era. He'd moved slightly off Formula One uh, in the last three or four years at Red Bull. Uh, but anyway, so it's, it's quite a significant change and it is another restructure from McLaren. Um, but, uh, oh, here we go. There's oh, we've got accident. a car off. It's a Williams at a time where they really didn't need another and crash on the board. And it's Logan Sargent, you're absolutely right, Andrew, who has found the wall, made contact with it. That has brought out uh, a red flag, and that is coming through uh, turn seven uh, and approaching uh, turn eight as well. So that's coming towards uh, the, it's coming through the Dunlop curve, I think. You as, don't tend to have small accidents at Dunlop. <laughs> no, and Sargent there is moving. He's taking his steering wheel out of the car, but the front wing has taken damage as well, and just off the back of our talk about the chassis and, and they are still down on parts they won't have a, a spare chassis still for another few races he said on the radio that he's okay as he clambers out of uh, that stricken williams puts his steering wheel back in red flag out in fp1 it actually doesn't look too bad considering where he's gone off as you say harry the front wing's gone but the rest of the car looks relatively okay the front the wheels are all attached still so I think he's got away with a relatively small accident, actually, having said that you don't have small accidents at Dunlop. <laughs> Turns out he seems to have had one. But uh, it's not what Williams need, because the reason they ended up in the problem in Australia was that they're out at the short of, as well as being uh, not having a spare chassis, they're also short of spare parts. So they could have done without this, frankly. Yeah. Shh. Sergeant out of the car, and, and you can see how upset he is. Uh, hands on his hips, looking at the car, and chucks his hands away in frustration head dropped visor slightly lifted up and uh, walks away and uh, we'll see but on the face of it we'll see uh, what exactly he did as we just get a replay now and in the approach to it he just runs out wide and it is still a fairly big whack uh, he runs out wide onto the grass loses control in the gravel tilts the car into the wall spins out again front wing front right corner damage as well this is the sound yeah. of it on board through the left hander runs out of room that's a little bit of a clumsy one that's that's one of those accidents that basically he's just you okay i'm sorry man yeah i'm okay you go alice he, he's basically just ran wide He's come over the crest, which is, you sat very low in these cars, so that's slightly blind. And then he's he's just tagged the grass, and I've been there. I mean, I've not had a crash like that when tagging the grass, but you think, I'll be okay. I, I, I've got this. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, the grass has just kicked the rear of, of the car, and he's, uh, he's, he's gone on round, so... Do you know what, Alice? He's had the same accident as he had out of the last corner in Japan last year. Yeah. It's it's actually not really acceptable, especially in P1. He did it in qualifying last year. He got the, the last corner at Suzuka is deceptive. It looks like it's not really a corner, but apparently when you're in the car, it really is a corner. Especially in a Formula 1 uh, in car. In a Formula 1 car, especially. And Robert Kubica had a big shunt there in the Williams a few years ago, 20, 2019, I think. Logan Sargent did the, almost a carbon copy of that crash last year in qualifying. And now he's done the same thing at Dunlop. He's got himself, as you say, a little bit too wide. Wheels slightly off the track, and you just don't get away with that at Suzuka. That, you just, that's, what's, that's why... It's one of the reasons why the drivers love Suzuka so much. It's not just that the track is amazing to drive when you stay on it. It's that it's so easy to not stay on it. And when you don't stay on it, you have a big accident. And that's exactly what's happened to Sargent. It's one of those old school circuits. I guess if you compare it to any circuit in the UK, I'm going to go with either a Cadwell or an Alton Park. One of, one of those that you really are punished if you make a mistake as the marshals always doing a fantastic job the tractor's picked up sergeant's car now and uh, being taken off 
to the edge of the track, be placed on the flatbed, and then will eventually get taken back to to the Williams garage. But yeah, it, it's really punished you. And, and you're right, Andrew. It, as a racing driver, you ask any driver, would you rather drive around? a poor Ricard, whereas literally I think it's probably impossible to really hit anything at poor Ricard, or would you rather go to a circuit like Suzuka, where if you do make a mistake, you are punished, and I think it's that danger element, that element of risk, which is is adds to the enjoyment of driving a circuit, and, uh, and yeah, ultimately, you get paid the price for it if you do... Uh, something uh, as silly as sergeant so i'm looking at that and what's happened is he's got slightly too wide on the bit where the bit of the exit of the corner where there's a curb and he's obviously thought i'll get away with this because it's just the curb i'll be fine but the problem is that the curb stops and then it becomes a, sec a section where you've got the asphalt of the track and then the um the sort of sandy gravelly bit of the runoff and so the where the curb end, and he should have known that that's the problem He's thought, well, the cur I'm on the curb, it'll be okay. But the problem is the curb stops and he gets onto the gravel and then he loses the car. And um, where, what he should have done in first practice is lift. And, yeah, and not if he lifted, he would have been absolutely yeah. fine. And he, and he isn't. And with the shot of, um, of James Vowles, the team principal, on the pit wall there. And normally they try and keep a poker face, don't they, team principal, in <laughs> these situations? But James, I shouldn't laugh, but... <laughs> He looked like uh, he looked like someone had given him some very bad news, which I think effectively they had, haven't they? But th but that just shows that the split second decisions that these these drivers have to make. It's easy for us, of course, to sit here and go, oh, we'll watch the replay from this angle. Oh, okay, it doesn't look too bad. Oh, we'll watch it from this angle. That, he has literally got a split second to decide whether a I totally back out of it. I, I lift. B I've got this, I can keep it full throttle, which is obviously what Sergeant did decide, and ultimately ended up leading to, to the crash. So, but that's what separates the, the good from the great, doesn't it? Making the right decisions in those sort of times. We've seen Max Verstappen, you know, do some spectacular saves, whether that's just the talent or the or a bit of luck that brazil one where he spun in the straight springs springs to mind whether that was his his talent but sergeant we do we do see it over and over again and you touched on it andrew that it just keeps happening and happening over and over again and and, and do williams get halfway through the season or a few races in if, if let's say danny ricardo the rumors you're hearing has got till miami can Williams play something like that on to, to Sergeant and say, look, mate, unfortunately, you're causing us way too much damage, which essentially is money that Williams may not have to spend on making new parts, which cost a lot, a lot of money. I'm sure there's plenty of drivers that would love to step in that seat. So you can see what's happened, Alice. He's on the soft. He's gone out on the soft tire, which Lewis Hamilton, by the way, has just gone fastest uh, by nine tenths by his, on his soft tire run. And he's on his first lap on the soft tire, and he's thought, I, I don't want to waste this lap because if I lose this lap, then the tires have got have lost their peak because uh, Suzuka's so demanding on tires, and it won't be quite the same. That's the thought process that's flashed through his brain in a millisecond or two as he's gone a little bit wide at Dunlop. But it's, it's, it was the wrong decision. He should have backed out of it. And um, because, of course, now he, never, the tyres haven't lost half a lap. Have they? They've been gone in a bin <laughs> and gone. so, so many, so several thousand pounds worth of car parts. But one factor, of course, racing here earlier on in, earlier in the year that we usually do, air temperature is at 16 degrees track temperature is 24 degrees and it's building that tire temperature of course they do have the use of tire warmers but sooner those come off and the cars trundling down the pit lane heat will be lost so certainly in these kind of temperatures the heat will you know seep sap whatever word you want to use out of uh, of the tires so it is up to the driver once they are on track harry to to try and generate that tyre temperature and obviously it's a lot harder to do in, in colder conditions so Sergeant would have done a, a build up lap but maybe he just didn't get enough temperature in those tyres and uh, speaking yesterday to, to media Sergeant said it's Formula 1 if you're careful you're nowhere so it's really not even a question you have to be committed confident and hope nothing goes wrong 
unfortunately in this case Fast forward, it did eh? go wrong <laughs> and uh that's brought out the red flag in FP1, although I think we're just about to get going again. The clock continues to count down in free practice one, uh, or free practice if there's a red flag. So uh, for those who want to keep syncing up, it's 20 minutes and 34, 33, 32 seconds remaining of free practice one. And just before the red flag came out, uh, Lewis Hamilton had stuck uh, the soft compound tyre on and gone fastest by nine tenths of a second. Uh, the Mercedes a 1.30543. Uh, then Verstappen in second. Uh, Norris had also just put a set of softs. Uh, hasn't done a lap on them yet, though, before the red flag came out. Then Alonso, Perez, the top five. Russell, Leclerc, Sainz, Sonoda, Bottas, the top 10. Stroll, Joe, Piastri, Gasly, Ocon, the top 15. Sergeant Hulkenberg, Magnussen, Iwasa and Albon. The 20 drivers uh, taking part now down to 19 uh, when we get this session back underway, which uh, it is in just under a minute's time. 12.11 uh, local time. It will get going as Carlos Sainz is released from his Ferrari garage and makes his way to try and get prime spot down at the pit lane exit. But he's uh, fallen foul. He's uh, four cars behind in the queue. Yep, left uh, a little bit too late there. I saw a nice addition to the Haas there. GoPro, did you see that? Attached to uh, the front of the car. Um, for, for aerodynamic reasons? Uh, or? Well, yeah, <laughs> maybe it's a track-specific <laughs> addition to, to there. And we're just... You obviously at home won't be able to see this shot, but we are seeing a good shot of the, the Red Bulls here queuing in the pit lane. You can actually see a little bit of heat coming off the tyres so coming out of the tyre blankets they have got the heat but that's the, the one thing we're queuing at the end of the pit lane you're losing tyre temperature as now the pit lane does go green Max Verstappen first out followed closely behind by Sergio Perez George Russell then we've got Carlos Sainz previous race winner last time out grandstand still packed Harry lots of fans there was a young fan there that had a sign say sorry to my teacher for skipping school it's a Ferrari is my excuse I think that is a perfectly valid excuse very very good that was would have been my excuse while uh, <laughs> while I was at school Back underway then uh, for the last 18 and a half minutes of free practice one. Uh, Russell heading out there as well, uh, just in front of uh, uh, Leclerc. Alonso out there, Albon Stroll. Iwasa makes his way out from uh, the pit lane to Ayumu Iwasa, the young 22-year-old Japanese driver making his uh, practice debut in place of Daniel Ricciardo. And while they try and sort themselves out on the first lap out of the pits, it's almost uh, racing between uh, the Aston Martin of uh, that's uh, Fernando Alonso, George Russell in the Mercedes, and uh, you've got Carlos Sainz in there as well, fighting their way three abreast at one point through Dunlop, sorting themselves out through the first two Degners, just trying to find uh, that bit of a track where they can keep a gap and try and have a bit of clear air in front of them but unfortunately uh, they've already been caught up by Albon in the Williams and the other Aston Martin of Lance Stroll so uh, sorting yourself out proving a little trickier than usual I was waiting for you to really go full voice there Harry no, they're not getting that it's too early voice. too early they're not getting that just yet yeah track position of course Although if that was the race then absolutely <laughs> wouldn't that be mega that would be I'd be jumping up and down uh, but track position of course is vital you want to have clear track in front of you and Max Verstappen who we're riding on board with now certainly has that nicely preps the final corner to get on that throttle a split second earlier to power down the straight crosses the start finish line to, to start his first flying lap coming out of the pits flies through turn one and actually we there's rumors that we might get a few showers over the weekend so i've heard through some some colleagues uh on the ground whether we will i think that will spice up it's quite an awesome circuit to drive in the wet I have to say it does produce some some great racing Max Verstappen of course that won't really stop him of course he is already on the soft tyre two tenths quicker than Lewis Hamilton's first and personal best first sector flies now down heavy on the brakes looking nice and tidy I would say so far from Max Verstappen yeah makes it look easy 
is this new normal service being resumed once again after having to retire from the Australian Grand Prix with uh, brake issues last time out, his first retirement uh, in a year, last retired at the Australian Grand Prix, uh, or two years before I should say actually, so Verstappen then back with a vengeance in Japan, makes his way through the left hand of 130R. There is a McLaren to his right as he comes into the braking zone for the last couple of corners. Pit lane entry to your right. It's still a right hand turn as he makes his way onto the start finish straight, crosses the line in that Red Bull, goes fastest, a 1.30, almost half a second clear of Lewis Hamilton, his teammate Sergio Perez, just comes across the line though and is just under two tenths behind his teammate. Verstappen and Perez making it a 1 2 at the moment for Red Bull NFP1. Hamilton Alonso on the soft as well, slots up into four signs. The Australian Grand Prix winner on the soft compound attire as well comes across the line and splits Perez and Hamilton, goes third fastest. So, a majority of the drivers now, of course, on the soft tyre and the closing stages of this session. Signs were probably slightly disappointed, but a good lap, I would say, from, from Perez. And I'm saying a good lap because he is within two tenths of his teammate, which, uh, without sounding too harsh to Perez, we don't really see that that often. But there we go. The sound you can hear now is riding on board with Charles Leclerc, who's got a nice tribute helmet to his good friend, Jules Bianchi, as he flies through into the final chicane now heavy on the brakes taking a lot of curb at the first part of the chicane a lot of curb at the second part of the chicane as well out through 18 which is the final corner jumps up to p6 uh, a few tenths off his teammate carlos signs in third and half a second off max verstappen and Lando Norris just coming across the line as well. Lost a lot of time in that first sector, though, uh, for Norris. But, yeah, this Suzuka track, uh, it can be an emotional one with uh, a couple of drivers, including, as you say, Alice there, uh, Charles Leclerc running a, a tribute helmet uh, using the same colours that the, uh, the French Formula 1 driver Jules Bianchi raced uh, in his Formula 1 career. Uh, it was 10 years ago at this track where uh, Jules Bianchi racing for the Marussia Formula 1 team had uh, that fateful incident which uh, eventually saw him sadly lose his life but uh, uh, a bright young talent uh, that many believe were destined to race for Ferrari one day sadly never came to be but is uh, remembered fondly by everybody in the paddock and uh, tributes are being shown uh, up and down the grid this weekend uh, just had a bit of a moment though coming out of uh, the pit lane exit with uh, Nico Hulkenberg in the house desperately trying to get past uh, the RB in front of him Alice what did you make of that well he crossed the the white line pit lane exit which is under investigation you are not allowed to to cross that you have to follow the uh, he's, stay he's within been, the he's lines been, he's been done for it as well on uh, on race control they've noted it um, so you have to follow within the, stay within the lines basically until uh, you get to the end of the pit line pit lane exit line but he's not done that because he was getting held up quite severely by one of the RBs. I'm not entirely sure which one it actually was, but in his defense, I mean, he, in theory, he should have stayed behind the RB, but that RB was going incredibly slowly out of the pit lane. I'm sure there is a new rule this year where you are not allowed to go and back off that much. I mean, I reckon I could have walked faster than the pace that that RB was, was driving out of the pit lane. So that will be uh, Nico Hulkenberg's defense. I won't be representing him. Uh, I'd rather <laughs> rather not. But uh, that will be his defence. Anyway, as uh, popping up the order is Esteban Ocon. Alpine have brought upgrades as we're seeing a slow mo of him going slightly wide. That looks like on the exit of 130. Ah, yes, it was. He jumps up into 14th place. Are you going to run us through Alpine's upgrades? Uh, well, I can do. Uh, Alpine have got uh, some bits for their front wing, uh, the corner, and the beam wing as well for Alpine um, in their attempts to try and uh, bring themselves uh, back into the hunt. We know their car is inherently overweight as well. They had some technical departures right at the start of the season too and, and Ocon and Gasly saying he's been driving like an animal uh, trying to uh, to get this car uh, around a track. Um, and Ocon though was, was fairly 
uh, vindicated out in uh, in Australia. Uh, in, actually, it was Saudi Arabia, wasn't he? he, he kind of thanks to um, Kevin Magnussen holding everybody up behind him. As a result, Ocon kind of got to get in that scrap in Tag the midfield <laughs> and then sort of you know play for points. They were there. Uh, the the car though and, and the pace inherently is not there though uh, for Alpine, uh, and they do currently uh, find themselves last in the constructors' championship with the best result so far: two thirteenth place finishes, uh, courtesy of uh, Gasly and uh, Ocon. Uh, so they'll be hoping for more. In fact, Ocon has scored uh, points in Suzuka on his last four visits. So hoping to uh, continue that trend for Esteban Ocon this weekend. Uh, we'll see if uh, those upgrades uh, prove beneficial. But uh, pretty much everybody bringing upgrades, bar uh, Mercedes and Haas. Uh, not bringing uh, too much uh, for uh, this weekend and Haas off the back of their uh, first double points finish uh, since Austria back in 2022. Great display once again of teamwork from the two Haas drivers uh, across the board actually in these first three races. Magnussen and Hulkenberg working really well together so far and, and making the most of this really difficult battle to score points for those teams in the bottom half of the field. Yeah, they've improved the areas where they were the weak as well. Their race pace does seem to be slightly better than it was last year. Of course, they have got reasonable one lap pace for, for qualifying. Hulkenberg doing a, a great job in particular uh, in the in the Haas. He's sitting in 12th at the moment. Magnussen, not sure if he's had a slight issue um, on his his push lap on the soft tyres down in, in 19th. But one thing to, to note as well, Harry, is due to these, I would say, cool temperatures uh, of 16.5 degrees current air temp, track temperatures dropped ever so slightly since we uh, resumed service after that red flag 23.4 degrees drivers are obviously feeling that the drop off on the soft tyre is not as big as it has been in past years in particular mainly I would say due to the track temperature so a lot of drivers pretty much every driver actually has, has done a push lap on the soft tyre and then has opted to do a cool lap so just try and cool down the tyres, give them a, a second uh, attempt then to do another push lap and a few drivers improving on that Yuki Sonoda. I say that, he was starting to improve. He's did a personal best in the first sector. He has uh, not done a personal best in the middle sector as he approaches now the, the final chicane. A little bit of a slide on that first curve. So turn 16 on the entry there into the chicane. Let's see if he does improve. No, he doesn't. So some drivers clearly feeling that they have still got life in the soft tyre, which may have an effect in qualifying that uh, they might have, you know, if you don't get your first attempt, uh, Bob on, you might have a little bit of life left in the tyres to, to improve uh, after having a little bit of a cool down lap. Just seeing a, a replay as well of Sergio Perez locking up, going into the hairpin. The left-hander front left on the soft compound tyre as well, just snatching the brake and smoke billowing from that front left tyre before he keeps it turned in left and carries on going. Seven minutes, seven and a half minutes uh, remaining of practice one. The stop and fastest from Perez, Sainz, Russell, Hamilton, the top five, Leclerc, Alonso, Piastri, Sonoda, Norris, the top ten, Albon, Hulkenberg, Bottas, Iwasa, Ocon, the top 15, Gasly, Stroll, Joe, Magnussen, uh, the 19 drivers who are still in this session with Logan Sargent uh, in the Williams 20th and last after crashing his Williams uh, in the gravel into the wall at Dunlop and uh, having to finish this session early bringing out the red flag at a time where uh, parts are at a premium for teams like Williams so uh, we'll keep you up to date with how that unfolds in the gap between free practice one and of course free practice two a little later on today you can hear that uh, on five sports extra as well five to seven in the morning for a session start time of seven o'clock UK time. So Verstappen's out there on an outlap now. He's put the hard compound, uh, he's got a new set of hards on for the uh, Dutchman and everybody else out there at the moment is either on the soft or on uh, the medium compound tyre. Just 
having done their fast laps on the soft now, just bedding them in and seeing, as you said, Alice, to see where the drop-off is, see how long uh, these ties can last for as Sainz plunges into that beautiful first turn. It really does sort of suck you in, doesn't it, into turn one, feed straight into turn two, you go back on yourself almost before you're then quickly into three, four, five, the, the S-curves. And that brings you round turn seven, the left-hander Dunlop up over the crest towards the first of the Degners of turn eight, then turn nine, 90 degree right hand up, the gravel and the grass so close to punish you for any small mistake. Hulkenberg coming up over the crest now through Dunlop. Hulkenberg currently on that soft compound of tyre, not chasing outright lap time at the moment in his Haas, but making his way. Degner two and approaching the hairpin left-hander. I listened to a great, I know I probably shouldn't plug any other podcasts that aren't the Checker Flag. You're but not a, going but a great, to. But a great podcast with, I, I, won't say the, I won't say the name of it, with Aya Komatsu, uh, the, uh, the team principal for uh, uh, the Haas. Of course, the man who stepped up uh, this year to, to replace Gunther Steiner after he departed the team uh, at the beginning of the season. Oh, Hulken, Hulkenberg just running slightly out wide over the curves coming through Spoon. Just has to ease off the throttle slightly and, and uh, straighten up that Haas. But it is a great podcast. It's a real get to know uh, for Ayo Komatsu, uh, who, who's a massive rugby fan. He used to play it when he was younger. And, and he used to, there's a lot of chat when you talk to anybody in Formula One, especially when they work in the engineering side, where they. Uh, send letters to, to all of the teams back in the day normally trying to get a job but he sent a letter to all of the teams and, and some big publications as well um, wasn't asking for a job just asking what university should I go to I want to work in Formula 1 where should I go uh, so I just found he's, just, he's got a, a lovely temperament about him and, and it's a great get to know of course he's been around for a few years and, and they, he talks about his time at, at Lotus and Lotus Renault working with uh, Vitaly Petrov and, and Petrov getting uh, that podium in Australia and Melbourne back in 2011 and of course working extensively with Roman Grosjean who we then followed of course uh, to Haas so it's a really it's a really interesting one um, uh, chat with uh, with Tom Clarkson so you can probably guess which podcast it is uh, so, giving it away now uh, yeah well you know if you, I, I'm, I'm plugging it and not telling people where to go so um, Harry's not here for fruit practice too we know why <laughs> it's a really it's just a really uh, a, a really interesting chat uh, to hear the insights of, of uh, one of the, the newest team principals uh, on the grid and and I think there was a bit of talk, I think coming from Steiner as well, um, rhetoric that uh, they sh has, shouldn't really have been, or were they on purpose playing down their expectations coming into this season? Uh, Ayakamatsu has, has kind of dismissed that uh, completely because we all thought, oh, it sounded like Haas were, were going to be in pretty, pretty bad shape before even the start of the season but I think they've been one of the surprises of the year so far and certainly the, the, the best at the moment in, in that in that bottom five uh, battle just well they, they are behind RB but they've got two points finishes and RB only have one I would agree with that yeah I'd certainly agree with that Harry's Lewis Hamilton now the sound you can hear is running on board with him as the peels into the pits a very quick pit stop soft tyre comes off a medium use set go on nice smooth pit stop practice there for the mercedes team which of course uh is important for the for the, the pit crew to get in as much pit stop practice as they can they do to get sessions uh, throughout the weekend where they are allowed to practice when the car's not on track which basically means that the car goes into the pit lane a couple of mechanics will push the car they'll have someone that will sit in the car and then they'll stop on the marks and do the pit stop but that's good to get your references and good to get your marks but it's uh, I know a lot of people that do that say so it's not quite the same as having a car coming up in much higher velocity um, and then having to to do it under a stressed environment so it is always good for the uh, pit crew to get a bit of practice in in these free practice sessions as Charles Leclerc now circulates on the hard tyre 2.3 seconds off Max Verstappen soft tyre time in the first sector but no one really setting any personal bests out there at the moment as uh, Charles Leclerc kicks up a little bit of dust gets away with it quite nicely though but just look at actually Harry at the track temperature it still it's slowly slowly dropping and of course when qualifying is on tomorrow 
that is 3 p.m. local time, which is the time that we will have free practice to later on today. So this is not really too much of a relevant session. I mean, of course it is. But uh, in terms of qualifying track temperatures, um, interesting to see if within the, the hour. I did note the temperature down at the start of the session. It's dropped by 1.5 degrees, which people might say, well, that's not too much. But it certainly can play... Uh, play a part in uh, track temperature and car perform uh, in sorry tire temperature and track performance as well yeah well uh, we'll uh, look forward to seeing how uh, fp2 unfolds a little later on uh, last 30 seconds or so though of free practice one and smiles adorned on all of the fans in the grandstand so happy to see f1 cars back out on track i mean it really wasn't that long since we were last in japan racing of course uh, in the back end of last year the japanese grand prix has now been shifted much earlier in the season in April, the earliest it's ever been, uh, the Japanese Grand Prix. Uh, we'll then have another week off before we then head to China and then Miami before we then get into the European leg of the season and arrive in Imola. Of course, the uh, first of the sprint races as well in China. So uh, worth noting those down as to what's coming up over the next uh, few weeks in Formula One. But kicking off the Japanese Grand Prix this weekend with free practice one. The chequered flag has fallen. Hamilton still on those medium compound tyres, just making his way now, bouncing across the curves through the final chicane, round the final corner. He's following the Haas of Hülkenberg through and uh, takes the chequered flag. At the end of the session then, it's Max Verstappen with a 1.30.056. He finishes a tenth quicker than his teammate Sergio Perez. Signs his third, Russell and Hamilton, the top five. Leclerc, Alonso, Piastri, Sonoda, Lando Norris, the top 10. Ocon, Albon, Hülkenberg, Bottas and Stroll, the top 15. Iwasa in his Formula One Grand Prix weekend debut. The young 22-year-old Japanese driver backed by Red Bull in place of Daniel Ricciardo for FP1. Finishes his first session in 16th place, about two seconds off the pace. Ahead of Gasly in 17th, Joe Guanyu 18th, Kevin Magnussen 19th for Haas, and Logan Sargent 20th and last after having to uh, finish the session early due to crashing in the Dunlop curves. And... Uh, damaging his Williams brought out the red flag there'll be work to do for the team once again to get that car ready for free practice two later on which you can hear live uh, on five sports extra five to seven on air for a seven o'clock in the morning start so make sure you've got your tea or your coffee ready for that one but Alice it's uh, back to normal service Red Bull one two for stamping ahead of Perez yeah it, it, it is. I mean, I've got no comment to add to that. It is, certainly is normal service resuming at the top. Carlos signs a couple of tenths back from Max Verstappen, but uh, I would say a pretty decent first session for jo George Russell and Lewis Hamilton. Both four tenths adrift of Max Verstappen at the top of the times, but they're sitting certainly higher than they were in uh, Australia in fourth and fifth there um, I would say maybe a disappointing session for McLaren certainly how the pace that they had here last year they they looked pretty strong last year Lando Norris finished the race in in P2 and Oscar Piastri of course P3 so it was a double podium and they had a good good race last time out as well so uh, they'll be slightly disappointed with this this first practice session but uh, Mercedes will be will be feeling a bit more positive than they were last time Absolutely. Well, they, they've uh, they've carried uh, Lewis Hamilton has carried a lot of optimism in, into this season. It just doesn't seem to be uh, paying off in, when it comes to the race. I'm sure we'll chat uh, more about that in FP2 as uh, Ayumu Awasa gets wheeled back into his garage. He'll hand that car over to Daniel Ricciardo for the rest of the weekend, who has been watching on uh, from the pit wall alongside team principal Lauren Mekis as practice starts uh, continue and get underway. They line up as far forward as they can on the grids and wait for the lights to go off before they then practice their starts. Very crucial in laying down some rubber as well on the right side of the grid and uh, figuring out how your start procedure is working around this track. But uh, 
an interesting first session. Still a lot more to uh, unfold. Let's hear what Awasa thought of his first FP1. Okay, you. That was a clean session. You should be pleased. Good job. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for amazing this opportunity. Let's hope we see him uh, back again in uh, a Formula One car sometime soon. Awasa will return to his uh, Super Formula season, but uh, working hard in the background for RB and uh, as a part of the Honda Formula Dream project as well. Uh, and a lot of competition then for those Red Bull seats, perhaps two might be uh, up for, for grabs come the end of the year. We don't know. The driver market continuing uh, uh, to unfold, but Max Verstappen putting his name right at the top of the classification once again after his retirement in Melbourne, bouncing back so far, uh, finishing FP1. Uh, over a tenth and a half clear of his teammate Sergio Perez. Carlos Sainz third with the two Mercedes, uh, Russell and Hamilton at the top five. Uh, we'll be back for FP2 to see how it all unfolds further from uh, five to seven local time. My thanks to Andrew Benson and Alice Powell. Uh, I've been Harry Benjamin. Uh, this has been uh, an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live.